Good morning. If you open up your Bibles, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I've been teaching at our church, Clarissa Bible Church, the book of 2 Corinthians, verse by verse. And this morning we're going to look at one verse out of 2 Corinthians, and that's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And so let's read this, or I'll read it to you. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so let's have a short word of prayer before we look into this verse. Father, trust that my speech would be pleasing to you, first of all, and then the saints, Father, could say amen to the clarity of teaching, that it would be accurate and practical, simple for all to understand, and by your Spirit, Father, it would be effective in all of our hearts, and so that you would just direct again with you receiving the honor and glory in my thoughts and the saints, so we could say with, in our thinking and then with our mouths, amen, and we ultimately then give you the glory. And so I trust that you would just direct here with the teaching of this uh, very powerful verse, Father, regarding the Christian life and how to grow in grace and knowledge of our Son, of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> A couple of words that we just want to bring out in 2 Corinthians 3.18 at the beginning here, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. And so the title of this morning's message is, right out of our text, being transformed by beholding. Being transformed by beholding. And so we, what we want to do is just look at our text um, word by word or phrase by phrase. And what we want to draw your attention to initially is the beginning of our verse where it says, but we all <clears throat> with unveiled face. Now right before that, if you look in your Bibles in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, it says... But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Now notice in verse 18 the word unveiled, and now notice in verse 14, four verses before, the word veil. And then also notice the idea of being blinded, and so that's what a veil does, it blinds you, and then when you're unveiled, obviously you're not blinded anymore. And so we see in 2 Corinthians 3.14, individuals' minds are blinded because there's a veil covering their thinking or covering their eyes. And the reason it's veiled is because the reading of the Old Testament would never have you come to the conclusion of seeing the light of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. But in the end of verse 14, it says the veil is taken away, where? In Christ. If you look at a Understanding of this is our picture that we will just um, have throughout the rest of our message. An individual can desire to read their Bibles and try to understand the message, but apart from the Spirit of the Lord and apart from a humble heart, the Lord will not reveal to them, especially if they're just thinking of reading the Old Testament, they will not come to the knowledge of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think of a cross-reference in our next chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you would begin in verse 3, it says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so notice in verse 3 the word veiled 
is there again. And so if we break down 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, and what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news from God of Jesus Christ and salvation through him. And we know that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so an individual, before they're saved in our text here, says that the gospel is veiled. And ultimately, it's the veil of unbelief. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those individuals who are what? Who are perishing. This is a place of God's fiery judgment. Eventually, the eternal lake of fire. And how is the gospel veiled? Whose minds the God of this age has blinded? With a small g there, we recognize that's Satan. The God of this world has blinded those individuals who do not believe. Notice the one condition that Satan desires to keep individuals from understanding is simple belief in the gospel. And belief in the gospel is in that person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. So Satan is the God of this age, is desiring to keep people from believing, and he has a power in this world system to keep individuals from believing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, the one person, the unique God-man, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. His, at his atoning death met our condition as sinners. He bore our sins and put them away forever. He stood charged with all of our sins. Isaiah 53 says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Instead of sending us to hell because of our sins, Jesus Christ was sent to be the propitiation for all of our sins. All of our sins have been paid for. And so we see a holy God dealing with the question of our sins, and Christ said, it is finished. They have been paid in full. And so Satan desires then to keep individuals from believing the gospel of the glory of Christ. That it would shine on them that their hearts and their minds would be unveiled. Verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God, with the big G, the one and true God, who could take care of your sin debt for you through His Son, the Lord Jesus. He is the one who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. And so in our text, 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, we all here, with unveiled face, before we were saved, we had veiled faces. We were not saved by the grace of God. And so we understand when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ then, according to 2 Corinthians 3.18, our, face, our faith, face is unveiled. And those that do not place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it says they are perishing. That's why 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So I would ask you this morning, are you saved by the grace of God here? Is your face unveiled or is it still veiled? Is your mind still veiled because you have not trusted in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? But to those of us that are saved, we can say we now have an unveiled face. And that's what 2 Corinthians 3.14 again says, But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the old, reading of the Old Testament, because the veil then would be taken away in Christ. Two verses later, in verse 16 in 2 Corinthians, it says this, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil then is taken away. And when you turn to the Lord, it means a 180 degree change of mind. It means that you have now placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have turned from the law works mentality that you thought you could get saved by before and you have canned the law works mentality and placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You have turned to him for salvation. And therefore now you could say the veil has been taken away and you could say an old phrase, now I what? Now I see the what? 
I see the light, right? I see the light of the glorious gospel by faith. I turn from my human viewpoint ways in thinking of how to be saved by my works and turn to the message of grace, how the Lord Jesus Christ saves me by faith alone in Christ alone. The veil then is taken away. Another verse that is a nice a, a cross-reference verse for this is Acts 26, 18. It says, To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness, from the veil, to the light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so our text says we as believers, with what kind of face? An unveiled face. Individuals that are saved by the grace of God. And so this text here in 2 Corinthians 3.18 is for the believer. The believer who has an unveiled face, they understand salvation by grace and they're saved and secure by God's faithfulness. But we all with unveiled face, beholding, or is that our next word? Beholding. Now if you just think of the etymology of the word, word beholding, it means be or thoroughly hold, absorb. To be thoroughly absorbed with something. It also has the idea of keep in view or something that is very impressive. And so growing up in Duluth, it doesn't become old hat to go down to the canal and keep in view something very impressive. You see a ship going through and it holds your attention. It's something that you can continue to go back to and be thoroughly absorbed by this sight. Something that is impressive. Just thinking of this word behold throughout the word of God, we'll just read some verses and think of the understanding of how the Lord wants to be thoroughly absorbed, keep something in view, something that is very impressive. Matthew 12, 18, it says, Behold, be thoroughly absorbed, keep in view my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. Be thoroughly absorbed with our servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another place this word behold is used in Hebrews 10, 7. Then I said, behold, be thoroughly absorbed with this. Jesus Christ has come in the volume of the book. It is written to do the will of the Father. Another place this word behold is found is in John 1, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, be thoroughly absorbed, keep in view something and it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be very impressed with the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Also, Romans 9.33 says, As it is written, Behold, be thoroughly absorbed with this. I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and get a hold of this. Whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, will not be disappointed or put to shame. That's impressive. Another time the word, is be, the word behold is used. Behold, be thoroughly absorbed with this. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you and me. What grace. That we should be called the children of God. Be thoroughly absorbed with this. That's impressive that you and I could be called a child of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. And one more time where this word behold is used in Revelation 21.5. Then he sat on the throne and said, Behold, Someday, all things are going to be made new. Someday, we're going to go home as a believer in the Lord to be with Him forever and to be with His people forever. Get a hold of that. Be thoroughly absorbed that He is going to make all things new. And He said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. So that's our understanding of this word, behold. And so, in our text here, we are to behold, be thoroughly absorbed. In fact, it's the one, at, the one word in our text that we are responsible to do in, our text, in this text in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And so we all, as believers with unveiled faces, we now have the ability to discern the things of the Spirit of God. We can then behold, be thoroughly absorbed, and then it says, beholding as in a mirror. 
As in a mirror, a city like Corinth, famous for its bronze mirrors, would have particularly appreciated Paul's illustration. In the vernacular, this word mirror is used where the smoothness of certain silver bowls is described as such that anything brought close to them was reflected more clearly than mirrors. And I'm assuming more clearly than the bronze mirrors. And so the point is this. The readers of that day would have understood what a mirror did. It reflected an image. Whatever you place in front of the mirror, it would reflect. And they understood that in Paul's day, as you and I would certainly understand that today. So it says, Be we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Cross-reference verse for that, if you turn your Bibles to James. I also have it on the slide. is James chapter 1. James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, verse 23, it starts out by saying this. And we'll read through verse 25. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so notice in verse 23, we have our understanding of a mirror. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He sees what he is like in this mirror. He observes himself, but he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So if we're just trying to teach what the point is, that mirror clearly images to themselves what kind of person they are in terms of by way of where they're at spiritually. And then verse 25 says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and that would be then the word of God, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so the mirror then in our text is equivalent to the Word of God. And so what is our text saying at this point? As we, with an unveiled face, our number one responsibility is to be thoroughly absorbed, to keep in view something very impressive that we will find In the Word of God, the mirror. And what will we find that will impress us in the Word of God that we are beholding, that we are to be thoroughly absorbed in? We will find the glory of the Lord. The word glory is the Greek word doxa. And if you just take the etymology of the word doxa, it's doxo, it is something literally that is very apparent. In fact, when we have a doxology, ology means to speak, and you would speak about something very obvious, something that is very clear in your thinking, and you would say, I want to talk about that. That's what a doxology would be, just in terms of the word alone. And so the word doxa means that it's very apparent. And so let's look at the glory of the Lord, something that is very apparent about who he is and what he has done for us, in another section of the Word of God, in Hebrews chapter 1. Turn your Bibles, if you would please, to Hebrews chapter 1. And again, I have the text. And we'll read verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he 
had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Reading on to verse 4. And so what we're looking at here is, okay, I want to know about the glory of the Lord. I want to know something that's very apparent. And we're looking at Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. There can be other passages. But let's look at something very apparent. And then what would be your response to this very apparent Son of God? In verse 2 it says, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. And so now we're going to be pointed to His Son and we're going to look at a number of things about His Son that are very apparent. And then we will say, well, what kind of response would I have to this very clear, this very discernible Son of God in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3? In verse 2, he is destined to inherit all things. He has appointed him as heir of all things. What else do we know about him? His Son who also made the entire world. He is the creator of all things. What else do we know about the Son? Who being the brightness of his glory, he radiates the glory of God. Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, he is able to then manifest himself as God. He radiates the very glory of God. He is the express image of his person. He is the expression of the image of God. What else do we know about the Son? And upholding all things by the word of his power, he sustains the entire universe. What else do we know about the Son? He purged our sins. He had by himself purged our sins. He cleansed us from sin's guilt. He took all of your sins away. There is no purgatory. All of your sins have already been purged. Past, present, future, all have been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do then? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on I. He sat down at a place of honor. This was the place of honor before God the Father. Why did he sit down? Because his work was finished. And so now, as a result of looking at Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, it is very apparent that you understand who the Lord is and what He has done for you. He is destined to inherit all things. He is the creator of all things. He radiates the glory of God. He is the expression of the image of God. He sustains the universe. He cleansed us from sin's guilt. He purged us all of our sins. And He's now sitting down at the place of honor. And so when that is so clearly marked out in your thinking, it is so discernible, it's crystal clear, it's very apparent, what are some words that you would use for the Lord Jesus Christ? What are some words that you would use to express who the Lord Jesus Christ is? He is what? He's what? He's magnificent. He's, he's awesome. He's great. He is so worthy of praise and honor. So when we think of the glory of the Lord, it is very apparent that He is to be exalted. He is worthy of our praise and worthy of our honor and worthy for us to glorify Him. A doxology then is a speaking about something very apparent. What's very apparent? Well, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 makes it very clear. We have seven things there that are very apparent. And so therefore, this is what it means to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. I am to be thoroughly absorbed with who He is and what He's done for me. I am to keep in view someone who is very impressive in my thinking. I have an unveiled face. I can, by the Spirit of God, come to the conclusion that I've got an awesome God. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Of the Lord. And what will the Lord do? 
as a result of you being very impressed, being thoroughly absorbed with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, says in verse 18, you will then be transformed. You are being transformed. The word being means to come about. This is something God does to you as you keep in view, as you look unto Jesus, the author, and you finish your faith in your daily Christian walk. Something will come about in your Christian life. You will be transformed. This will be what God does to you. The word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, where we get metamorphosis. And meta means change, and morphosis Morphosis means form. If you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, we'll see this word transformed in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I'll read verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transformed is found in verse 2. Let's start in verse 1 and make some observations regarding Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, the word beseech is an appeal. It's an appeal by the grace of God. He says, for that reason, and for what reason is that? To you as believers, to you with unveiled faces, to you that are saved by the grace of God, by His mercies, by the compassion that He's shown towards you and me, at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. His loyal love, his loving kindness that he's shown towards you and me. Would you listen to this appeal? And what is this appeal? That you present, that you're willing to yield your bodies a living sacrifice. And what's a sacrifice? Sacrifice ultimately is to lose your life. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and me. And by his mercy, then you can say, you know what? I know that I'm saved by the grace of God. He was willing to be a sacrifice for me, so I am willing to lose my life for him. Matthew 16, 25 says, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life in sacrificial service for Christ, for my sake, will find it. You'll find out what really living is. And it's to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, set apart unto God acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The word reasonable is from the Greek word logikos, the English word it means logical. This is all very logical to be thoroughly absorbed with who my Savior is and what he's done for me. He deserves all the glory. That is so logical. In light of the fact that he saved me by his mercy, it's so reasonable in my daily life not to move in this direction of the world, but it's so reasonable if I add it up in my thinking to present myself to him, to be set apart to my reasonable service. I'm willing to be useful for Jesus Christ, not useless. And verse 2 says, and do not be conformed. The Greek word is schematzo, and it's where we get our English word, a schematic. The God of this world has a schematic. He has a blueprint for the lost, and he has one for the saved as well. Don't be conformed to this world. It's not reasonable. This world is passing away. What's reasonable, what's rational in our thinking before the Lord is what he has done for us, who he is and what he has done for us. I add all up in my mind and I'm willing to yield to him. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's our word, metamorphosis. Be willing to be changed. Allow the Lord to change you by the renewing of your mind. The word renew just simply means re, again, new, first place. Allow the Lord to have first place in your mind daily. And how do you do that? You simply are willing to behold him. You're so impressed. You're thoroughly absorbed. 
You're allowing the things of this world to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And you're, as you're growing, you're becoming more and more absorbed with who Christ is and what he's done for you. See, the Christian life starts in your thinking. You allow the Lord to transform you as you are willing to behold him in your thinking. So you can prove, means to con- the word prove means means to conclude by reasoning. Somebody says, yeah, prove it to me. And you want a bunch of reasons. And somebody lays out all the reasons and you say, okay, that's good for me. And so God has laid out all the reasons of why we should be willing to yield ourselves to him. so that you may prove now you can be transformed. You can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what have we seen in our text? But we all as believers with unveiled faces, we've seen the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Beholding our number one responsibility is to be thoroughly absorbed with the glory of the Lord by seeing him in in the written word of God. You're allowed the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. Feel at home. And then as a result, the Lord will transform you. You'll become more like Him. And that's what our next point is. You will be transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's the word image? Image. It's the Greek word icon. It's where we get our English word icon. It means a likeness of something. A father and a son can look alike. It can be a dead ringer. He can be a chip off the old block. And so as you are willing to behold him, to be thoroughly absorbed with the glory of the Lord through the word of God, you're then transformed into the same image. The image of who? The image, what's that same image? The glory of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Good cross-reference for that is, turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 says, And you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The understanding there is that we see the word renewed there, and this is something that as a result of beholding him, your mind becomes renewed and the Lord transforms you to be more into the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you'll become more like Him. See, when it says we have put on the new man, this means that we are a new creation in Christ. All things have become new. We understand our new position in Christ, our new identity, our new union with him. We have all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And again, the idea of renew is to be allowing him to be first place in your life. As you're willing to behold, be thoroughly absorbed with the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't, he's not old hat in your thinking. He is very impressive in your thinking because of who He is and what He has done for you. So what have we seen in our text thus far? We as believers with unveiled face we're now able to discern the things of the Spirit of God. The light of the glorious gospel has shined onto us through believing in Him. Beholding, our number one responsibility is to be thoroughly absorbed, keep in view 
as in a mirror, which we see it, we saw is the Word of God. We're allowing the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. We're taking time to meditate on His Word. We're able to then meditate and consider those things of the Lord Jesus Christ through His Word. And you will then see the glory of the Lord. And that glory of the Lord will be reflected into your thinking. And you will then be transformed. You will be changed into that same image, the image of the Lord Jesus Christ who become more like Him. From glory to glory. In Psalm 84, 7, it says, They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. What does it mean to go from glory to glory? From one degree of glory to another. From one stage of glory to another. As you continue to walk by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you, you're willing to behold him, be thir- thoroughly absorbed with who he is and what he's done for you. The Lord transforms you and you go from one growth stage to another. You become more like him in a little way here and a little way there and as you grow in grace and the knowledge of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Jay Chapel, I remember, quoted this verse and said, I don't know if it was his life verse or I think I remember him saying that. He said in Proverbs 4.18, he says, But the path of the just is like the shining sun the sh- that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. And that's the idea of from glory to glory as you're beholding him. Now we know Pastor Jay Chapel is in glory. None of us will ever be in perfect glory until we go home to be with the Lord, but the Lord desires to mature us, allow us to be transformed by his marvelous grace so we can go from one glorious stage to another in our growth of our Christian lives. And how is it accomplished? Simply by beholding him. And so, what have we seen at this point? But we all, as believers with unveiled faces, our number one responsibility, our primary concern in our Christian life is to behold him, to be thoroughly absorbed. Keep in mind, looking unto Jesus, walking by faith in him, seeking and setting your mind on those things which are above, abiding in him and his words abide in you, as in a mirror. The awesome glory of the Lord, something that's very apparent is who our Savior is and what He has done for you. As in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. The Lord will then transform you into the same image from glory to glory. And how is this all accomplished? By what power? Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Notice 2 Corinthians 3.17, if you would, right before 2 Corinthians 3. 318, which is our text, it says this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Notice that this whole transformation process, your responsibility is to behold The Lord will transform you, but it will be done by the power of the Spirit of the Lord. When you got saved, the Spirit of God indwelt you and sealed you. The moment you placed your faith in Christ, the Spirit of God then is your guarantee. The Spirit of God is now your divine illuminator, your power source for the things of Jesus Christ to become actualized in your thinking, the things to become real. Before you were saved, you didn't understand the glory of the Lord and the finished work of Christ, but now the Spirit of God has impressed you with His supernatural power, the things of Christ, the marvelous Savior that you have. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is now freedom. That's what our understanding of the word liberty is. And when you think of freedom, what is the understanding of freedom? Freedom is the exemption from external control or exemption from the law. 
See, before you were saved, you were under a law works mentality that said, I must gain the approval through my deeds, the things that I do and the things that I shouldn't do. And you could never then appreciate the finished work of Christ because you were always thinking in terms of what can I do to impress God? What can I do to please him? And the Lord is saying, I'm pleased with my son and his finished work on the cross. He has been made the propitiation for all of your sins. Would you place your faith in him? And when you do, now your face becomes unveiled. And this was all that the Spirit of God made real to you. Now in your Christian life, as you walk by faith in the Son of God, the Spirit of God will make real to you the glory of the Lord. You cannot get a hold of the glory of the Lord through a system of law works. The Spirit of God must be the illuminator and the power source for you to be able to truly give out a doxology. See, the legal mind, the mind that's under the external control of the law doesn't give out praises and honors and doxologies to the Lord because it's not very apparent to them that Christ is to have first place in their thinking. The legal mind says, here's what I am doing. I am first place in my thinking and that's who I, I need to impress God with who I am and what I'm doing for him. But it's the Spirit of God that shows us, that illuminates our thinking, that is the power source for us to be able to say, wow, I've got an awesome Lord. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, if you would, please. Galatians chapter 5. And we'll read verses 1 through 13. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. You'll never be able to enjoy your freedom in Christ with that leaven. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If I could just point out Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Notice in verse 1 it says, Stand fast, therefore, in this freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the external control of the law by which Christ has made us free. He made us free from the curse of the law. We are no longer under that system. Jesus Christ freed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. We do not have to try to please God by way of our works. We simply, our responsibility is to behold and be thoroughly absorbed with our awesome Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How do you get entangled again with the yoke of bondage? Quit beholding Him. Quit being thoroughly absorbed. Quit looking unto Jesus, the author and finish your faith, and think in terms of grinding it out in your Christian life. That's how you get entangled again with the yoke of bondage the things that you should think you should be doing and not doing to please God. Instead, you're saying, 
Lord, I'm just simply going to be thoroughly absorbed. I'm going to keep in view my Savior, Jesus Christ. And don't go to the other extreme then in Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, freedom to serve without without an external control of the law. You have been called to liberty. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, it was the love of Christ that we can say it's because of the love of Christ I know that I have eternal life by His grace. And through that that same love as a result of beholding Him, now I can be willing to serve other individuals. In fact, when we think of this understanding of the opportunity for the flesh. Colossians 2.23, when you put yourself under a legal system, Colossians 2.23 says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body. When you put yourself under a law works mentality, you're waiting for your flesh for an opportunity to let it rip somewhere, sometime. As you get tired of trying to live the Christian life by a law works mentality. And so the law works mentality is going to cause you to say, I just want to indulge in my flesh here or there. But as a result of beholding Him, the Spirit of the Lord will transform you into the same image from glory to glory, and you'll say, Lord, I just simply want You to get the glory here. And whatever I do, and I'm willing to be used by You, I'm willing to serve others, as a result of me beholding who Christ is and what he has done for me. And so it is by the Spirit of the Lord, through his power, that we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So what have we seen here this morning in our text? We, speaking of you and me as believers in Christ. And what does our text say? We have an unveiled face. Are you here this morning? Are you saved by the grace of God? Have you seen the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, your face is still veiled. But as a believer, you can say, I understand by the grace of God that I'm saved. All my sins have been paid for and He deserves the glory. What's my number one responsibility in the text? And in my Christian life, to simply behold Him. To be thoroughly absorbed with who Christ is and what He has done for me, what He is doing, and what He will do for me in the future. I'll ultimately go home to be with Him in glory. As in a mirror, as you take in the lovely Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, by beholding Him, the Word of God will reflect into you the what? the glory of the Lord. It'll become very apparent to you as you allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to transform you by you beholding Him that He deserves all the glory in your Christian life. And then what will the Lord do for you? He will transform you. He will change you more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. From one degree of glory to another. And this will all be by the Spirit of the Lord that is within you. The Spirit of God will illuminate and make real to you the glory of the Lord. I like what Warren Worsby says about this particular text. He says, When the people of God look into the Word of God, and see the glory of God, the Spirit of God transforms them to be like the Son of God. When the people of God, those with unveiled faces, look into the Word of God, willing to consider the truths found in the Word of God, you will then be reflect, 
will be reflected in your thinking is the glory of God. Recognizing the Spirit of God will transform them to be like the Son of God. I like what Jesus Christ said in John 11.40, and we'll close here with this. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this passage of Scripture. Trust that we would see that your desire for us, Father, is to simply be thoroughly absorbed, keep in view our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we would be able to take in from your word and be, allow the Spirit of God to empower us, illuminate us into your Son and to be more like his image. And Father, it's just simply being able to behold that awesome glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what your desire for us, Father. And then we can understand that the Christian life is simply to give you, in the end, all the honor and glory and praise that is due you and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Thinking of keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, and as we do, the Lord transforming us from the inside out. Let's uh, sing a song in closing about that, a familiar song to all of you I trust, number 460 in our hymnals, Be Thou My Vision. And let's stand as we sing, 460, Be Thou My Vision. Oh.